We are very excited today to have back again our friend and former guest, Israeli Ambassador Retired Yoram Ittinger. I am very honored to have what I consider to be a friend in Jerusalem, and I'm happy to have him back on today. So, Ambassador, um, we've got a lot to talk about. So, one of the things that we talked about before we hit the record button was I want to talk about current affairs, current situation in Israel. When I contacted you a week or so ago, I wasn't sure exactly what your living conditions might be. I thought maybe you had no power, no internet, and you're flying back. No, we're fine. So tell us how things are right now today, if you would, please. Well, uh, things in Israel are much more normal, uh, much more uh, uh, relaxed than uh, uh, suggested by media headlines. And the key reason for uh, most of Israel, most uh, Israelis to get back to our routine is for simple fact. We, we have been through many, many uh, bull rides before. Uh, this is another bull ride and we're going to stay on top of the bull for at least nine seconds, much more than, uh, than that. And uh, this has been the story of the Jewish people in general and the Jewish state in particular. We've been through destructions, we've been through exiles, we've been through pogroms, we've been through expulsions, we've been through uh, Holocaust, and we've been through many, many wars uh, and waves of terrorism uh, since Israel uh, was uh, re-established back in 1948. So, so this is just another one of those so-called uh, bull rides. And uh, history suggests that uh, uh, following each one of those uh, crises or confrontations or wars or waves of terrorism, uh, the Jewish people, Israel, uh, surged to new heights. Uh, you look at Israel today, 75-year-old uh, Israel, after large number of wars and uh, uh, terror campaigns, and uh, uh, no one would have expected Israel to reach the military heights, the technological heights, the agricultural uh, heights, the irrigation, the medical, the software, the hardware heights. Uh, and I think we have reached those heights for simple reason. Uh, we are confronted daily by very, very unique challenges. And we have uh, managed to transform those challenges or those crises into opportunities uh, which have catapulted us to new, uh, new heights in many respects. Uh, uh, this is the story of uh, Texas. Uh, Texas, the Lone Star, has faced many challenges since 1836 when it gained uh, independence. Uh, Texas is surrounded by states which uh, envy uh, Texas. Some of them don't like uh, Texas, but Texas, the Lone Star State, uh, has possessed this Lone Star spirit which aims at proving those who don't like it, those who uh, hate it sometime, that uh, Texas is better than uh, they are. Uh, our situation is slightly different because our neighbors don't only envy us, don't only dislike us or hate us, they also terrorize uh, us. And that requires us to roll up the sleeves even uh, higher. But the bottom line is that both the Lone Star State and the state of the Lone Star of David have uh, uh, mastered the art of transforming crisis into opportunities. And therefore, uh, contrary to media headlines, uh, if you would not know uh, that there is war 
uh, in uh, southern Israel, northern Israel, uh, you wouldn't guess it uh, when you are in other parts of Israel, in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Haifa, Natania, Herzliya, uh, coffee shops are full, uh, pubs, uh, restaurants are full, uh, people go to many uh, shows, uh, sport uh, events, uh, as if there is no uh, war. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, our hearts are uh, exclusively uh, with our soldiers uh, in Gaza in the south and in the north where we fight uh, Hezbollah terrorists. Well, and that, that that is exactly why I had wanted you to come on today and, and share this, because like you say, our media shows us all of the war pictures. They don't show us the part of Israel that's just being, you know, everyday life, normal life and living. And I'm going to hit the pause button for a moment on the record. When I got your email and you said, hey, uh, we're fine. And. I was relieved because I had been concerned truly for your safety. I, I, I had envisioned all kinds of things that weren't happening, but it's because that's what we are fed by our media. But that was exactly why I wanted you to be with me today and we can share truth about what really is, is going on. And I'm glad to know that at least part of Israel is, it, it's more or less life is normal, despite the fact that in your heart, yes, you're concerned for your soldiers that are fighting for your, your freedom. But you're totally right about the, the incredible um, spirit of Israel. And it's not unlike Texas. Uh, we do have a lot in common. And I, when you pointed that out in our previous interview, I thought that was very insightful. And frankly, I certainly did like that. So that was that was a good thing. And, and, and just just going to interject uh, the bull riding uh, comment you made a few minutes ago. I certainly like that. I think our fellow Texans will appreciate that as well. So I'm sorry, I, I kind of um, interrupted you, but please uh, keep going and just let's let's talk about, you know, life is normal. I know you've had Passover recently, and then you've got coming up pretty soon uh, another event that you'll be celebrating, which is your freedom. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, we'll, we'll celebrate on the on May the 14th. Uh, we'll celebrate Israel's uh, Independence uh, Day. And uh, uh, in Israel, the uh, Day of Independence is preceded uh, by a day of commemoration, uh, one day before Independence Day. And that day of commemoration uh, is dedicated uh, fully, but fully to commemorate uh, uh, fallen Israeli soldiers from the War of Independence in 1948 until this current uh, war, which means the vast majority of Israelis uh, spend time in different military uh, cemeteries. And if they're not in the cemeteries, they are in memorial uh, ceremonies or services. Uh, they uh, spend time uh, commemorating friends and uh, relatives uh, who, again, uh, were killed uh, in the uh, effort to keep Israel uh, the Jewish state uh, independent. And uh, unlike unlike uh, other Memorial Days, uh, this is not the day of uh, shopping. Uh, this is a day, again, fully dedicated to commemoration. And in fact, and in fact, it starts with a two minute siren. And that two minute siren means, that wherever you are in uh, Israel, even if you're inside a car on a freeway, you stop, you stand attention for two uh, minutes. And if you are in your car, you park uh, the car, you get out of the car, you stand attention next to your car, again, for two minutes. 
And for two minutes, people reflect on uh, those who uh, sacrifice their lives for the for our privilege to be uh, independent. And uh, uh, for non-Israelis, this is quite uh, an experience. I've seen a number of friends from the U.S. who were here in Israel on Memorial uh, Day, uh, which is again a day before the celebrations, the happy celebrations of Independence Day. And their initial reaction when the siren uh, went off, but it's either 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., their initial reaction was, what's going on? War? Bombing? And I said, no, no, relax. Just, let's just get up, stand attention for two minutes. This is how we pay respect to our fallen uh, soldiers. And, uh, and it seems to me that this is uh, quite an investment in sustaining the very special spirit which has made it possible for the Jewish state to survive the military and terror challenges uh, surrounding us. And whether you are a youngster, whether you're an older person, whether you're left or right, uh, secular or religious, we all share that, uh, <clears throat> that respect for our fallen, uh, fallen soldiers. Can I just say, I absolutely love that. I wish America would do that. You've lived here and you know we have a Memorial Day to commemorate those who have given their lives for this country. But you also know that we don't have that two minutes of silence and respect and attention for them. Sadly, that holiday, and you alluded to that, it has become a shopping holiday, a you know hot dog holiday, and there's less and less respect given to those who have given their very life for this country. And I love the fact that Israel does that. That's huge. And you do it the day before your Independence Day. I, I just find that incredibly touching and uh, very, very moving and special. And, and in fact, the minute, literally the minute, day of commemoration or Memorial Day is over, Right that minute, Independence Day celebrations start uh, on a very happy uh, tone uh, because uh, our state of mind is that uh, the fallen soldiers did not want Israel to go through a doom-like state of mind. The fallen soldiers sacrificed their life so we can go on uh, uh, in our routine life that we can uh, upgrade the quality of uh, life and therefore not only isn't there a contradiction between the happiness of Independence Day and the commemoration of Memorial Day, they are very much complementary of, uh, each, uh, of each other and uh, we certainly, we certainly uh, believe that commemoration uh, is tantamount to deliverance and forgetfulness uh, could bring one to uh, oblivion. In fact, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, the word uh, darkness is spelled exactly with the same letters as forgetfulness. Namely, when you uh, dwell on forgetfulness, you enter very dark period of your uh, life and the opposite obviously is true uh, with uh, commemoration. Commemoration means basically cultivation of our roots. If we do not commemorate our roots, uh, the tree is not going to grow. And the only way for the tree to grow is to water and fertilize uh, the roots, which are basically the memory or the commemoration of the circumstances that uh, facilitated the establishment of the Jewish state. That's incredibly insightful. And I wish every American would pay attention to that because you are so spot on. And I, I wish America could make some changes so that we could have our Memorial Day 
the day before our July 4th celebration. That's that's just impactful beyond words. And I, I, I know you're so correct in saying that you have to nourish, fertilize, and water the roots to keep the tree growing. And that's one of the reasons Israel has continued to, to prosper despite just unbelievable opposition. And America, sadly, we, we've not done that, and we need to take a lesson from Israel in that. Well, in fact, uh, as as you know, uh, we have so-called compulsory service, military service in Israel. It's mm -hmm. not compulsory because every Israeli, or I should be careful, almost every Israeli feels that it's a privilege to serve in the military, but we're talking about 18 to 20 year old uh, regular soldiers. Uh, it's three year service for male and two year service for female. And the reason I mentioned that is because now when the war goes on, especially in the South, but also in the North, every day uh, we have uh, interviews with uh, regular soldiers uh, who serve, who serve uh, in, in that uh, war. And when they are interviewed, you can uh, hear the impact of that commemoration. Because here you have 18 to 20 year old uh, youngsters, the regular soldiers. And when they ask, uh, how, how do you feel about that war? And they respond by referring to their uh, feeling that they're not just fighting to protect their lives, they're not just fighting to protect their family and their nation life. And they talk about, we are here to maintain the Jewish history. We are here to bolster the Jewish people. It's our role to uh, protect the heritage of our Jewish uh, fathers, the founding fathers, etc. Now, I, I would be impressed if uh, uh, history professors would talk about it, if older people would talk about it. But here you have youngsters, they just concluded high school and they're in regular service. And their feeling is that they are part of overall Jewish history. And I believe that this is the outcome of the annual commemoration of if I may say, what in the hell are we uh, doing here? Are we here just to survive? Are we here uh, to have peace? Are we here to have a uh, uh, successful uh, life? And the, sent the feeling is that it's much, much more. It's, no it's not just the pursuit of life, uh, liberty, and, and the pursuit of happiness. It's uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mission the mission of uh, uh, continuing the Jewish legacy. It's the mission of protecting the Jewish state. And that's something which I believe has made, has made uh, the Israeli military, the Israeli people as a whole, as uh, uh, effective, as successful as we have been. I'd say without doubt that is a factor. And there are plenty of Americans who disagree with me, and that's okay. I, I really don't care. I'm just going to say that America, if we adopted that same policy, that would solve a lot of the problems that we see in our country. And I know it'll never happen, but nonetheless, I can still say, I think it's a great idea and people can disagree with me and that's just fine. But that is a huge um, statement as to why Israel is what it is and how it has not just survived and existed, but it has thrived and prospered despite incredible opposition. Well, you have uh, symptoms of that uh, with some very sad aspects of the war. Uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, a bereaved father who lost uh, one of his four uh, sons uh, was interviewed on uh, Israeli state uh, radio. And uh, towards the end of the interview, the interviewer asked him, well, I assume that you must be pretty down, pretty uh, sad uh, for losing your, uh, your son. 
And I understand that you have three more sons serving right now in the war in Gaza. Uh, well, uh, I assume that uh, you expect them to be back at home uh, with you. And the response by the father uh, was, uh, no, this is not the case. Uh, as you know, in Judaism, we have seven days of mourning after a person uh, dies or is uh, killed. And he said, the other three children are here with us for those seven days of mourning, but they know very well that part of our own education at our home is for their top priority, which is to serve the people of Israel. And as soon as those seven days of mourning, of mourning uh, are over, they're going back to their units in Gaza. And then he said, and in fact, I'm still in the, uh, in the age of reserve duty, and I am going to join my unit as well after the end of the seven days of uh, mourning. And how, I old, said, how old was is, is he? Well, you know? he, he's, he's 50, uh, 54 year, uh, year old. Uh, uh, in Israel, uh, we have that active reserve duty, which means mm -hmm. every year you go through uh, refreshing training with mm -hmm. your uh, ground, uh, with a special operation unit, with your tank uh, units, with the artillery uh, units, with your commando uh, units, uh, whatever. So when uh, war occurs, uh, you can join the military. And the reason is that 75%, uh, 75%, 75 of our military force is composed of reservists. Uh, because uh, th there's no way we can maintain a huge military force. This, this would stifle the economy, the whole mm -hmm. country. So most of the military is part of the daily life in Israel. But when the, there is a call up, people know how to join their unit, where is their unit. And in fact, not only reservists in Israel, but this particular war has also demonstrated the very special Israeli spirit because many of the reservists were abroad, uh, some for job assignments, some for uh, tourism, uh, some for studying in American or European universities. And the minute they heard that there is a war, they all went to the nearby airport. They flew back to Israel, and in fact, and in fact, uh, uh, there is a, a national carrier in Israel, Israeli airliner El Al. Uh, they could not, they could not accommodate the demand for Israelis to come back to their units, and the Israeli Air Force had to dispatch to few airports in Europe special transport, military transportation uh, plane, and they returned to Israel loaded with Israelis sitting at, uh, not on seats, there are no seats in the transportation plane, but they were sitting uh, at, on the floor of the transportation plane, uh, coming back to their, uh, their unit. And we had, we had 130% rate of reporting, namely way, way more than was needed by their units. Uh, one of my relatives is a battalion commander, uh, artillery battalion commander, he's a colonel, and he told me that it was painful for him to tell some of the reservists, I'm very sorry, uh, you have to go back home. And he said they were trying all sorts of tricks they're trying to stay. And I, I told them, I'm very sorry. We have no room for you. If we need you, we'll, uh, we'll call you. But again, this is the, the outcome of uh, state of mind, which is nourished every single uh, year through uh, commemoration. That's incredible. To what age do people stay in as a reservist? Well, uh, I'm not sure exactly. But uh, uh, 
it was it was until uh, uh, October 7 the, until the age of uh, 45 uh, they are talking now about extending it but even though it was 45 a uh, significant number of uh, uh, top officers in the reserve mm -hmm. uh, have served until the age of 70, uh, 75. I can disclose that uh, one of my high school uh, friends, same uh, high school uh, class, uh, is a colonel in the medical uh, corps mm -hmm. and still serves active reserve uh, duty, which means a, a colonel, it's about between 50 and 100 days a year. He has to go through training, which will uh, maintain his proficiency as a top uh, military medical officer. That's incredible. It's like a lifetime commitment, really. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and by the way, uh, th this war uh, has been beneficial for Israel, obviously, uh, fighting terrorism. It has been beneficial also because when you fight uh, wars and if you fight it constructively, you draw the proper uh, lessons, uh, you also develop uh, very innovative ways of uh, fighting or in the case of this friend of mine from uh, my high school class, uh, innovative medical applications. And according to my uh, friend, uh, this very, very unique war it's a unique war in the sense that it's an urban warfare, but more than urban warfare, it's underground urban warfare in the tunnels and above uh, ground urban uh, warfare, unlike any war uh, which was fought uh, before. And as a result of that unique urban uh, warfare, we uh, uh, employed larger uh, number than any previous war of uh, medical uh, military people, both medical doctors as well as just uh, medics. And uh, they have developed special ways of sustaining the, the life of wounded uh, soldiers. Uh, and according to this friend of mine, they are American uh, officers from the medical military corps stationed in the Persian Gulf, uh, Central Command, that's the U.S. CENTCOM, who have been flying to Israel to study those new applications by the Israeli medical uh, corps, uh, applying it also to American uh, needs in Iraq uh, or somewhere uh, else. And this has been, by the way, the story of this uh, war. For instance, uh, we're talking about uh, urban uh, warfare. We have special uh, units and uh, a team of urban warfare experts, again from CENTCOM, came to uh, Israel. And according to a friend of mine who serves in one of those uh, special urban warfare uh, units, uh, the American team uh, visited the training site, because before entering Gaza, they go through an accelerated training session so they can come to Gaza in full shape. And uh, his comment was that when the Americans uh, observed the way they train, uh, the, the only reaction was amazing, because they didn't realize that uh, there are such battle... Uh, 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 tactics that can be devised. But the reason is because we face very unique challenges fighting in underground uh, tunnels, and I would say pretty sophisticated underground tunnels requires Israel to develop uh, new battle uh, tactics, and we do share it with our American allies. The same applies to Air Force. Uh, obviously, there are no dogfights uh, in our war against terrorists in uh, Gaza or in Lebanon, but uh, the intensity, the intensity of using 
the American F-15 and F-16 and F-35 is higher uh, intensity than any previous war. And when it comes to sustaining the effectiveness of America, of uh, any combat aircraft, the number one challenge is uh, a very effective overhaul of the engine. Because after so many hundreds of miles, the engine has to go not only through maintenance and repairs, but also through overhaul. And apparently, apparently, the Israeli Air Force, due again to the intensity of the challenge, has devised uh, innovative ways of sustaining the very top overall uh, level in a very quick uh, manner. And once again, American Air Force officers uh, arrived to Israel. And when they saw that, uh, they have decided, according to this friend of mine, to ship some of the engines of the American planes stationed in the Persian Gulf to be overhauled in Israel due to the very, very innovative way which we have devised in uh, Israel. And that's one of many examples how crisis uh, can be transformed into opportunity. And as is the case, as have, uh, as, uh, have been many cases in the past, we always share those innovations with our American allies. There's an old saying in, in the US, I don't know if you have heard this, but it says um, necessity is the mother of invention. And Absolutely. that's what that's what you're saying right there. I'm glad to know that our American Air Force uh, personnel are coming to Israel to learn. We have a lot to learn. And I'm also going to say something else that probably would not be very popular in some areas or um, circles, but I have a deep concern about our military readiness and about what we have to recruit from, because I'm concerned that our, uh, I'm just going to say that the younger generation has become very soft and I don't think they have the same commitment to the country that military people did years ago. Had we done like Israel and had a day of um, a, 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 a cel well, not a celebration, but a Memorial Day commemorating those fallen, followed by our Independence Day celebration. And if there had been compulsory service, I think a lot of young people would have a different outlook on life than what we do. And I, I admire what you guys have done. It's, it's, I, I think that, that a major mistake by, I think it was President Nixon uh, was when he put an end to compulsory uh, mm -hmm. service yeah. because military service is not uh, a military uh, issue alone. It is an issue of social cohesion and social uh, solidarity and national uh, commitment. Uh, you, you look at, at Israel uh, uh, with all the problems and maybe because of all the problems, the level of optimism and patriotism in Israel is among the highest, if not the highest in the world, irrespective, again, of whether you're right or left or secular yeah. or religious or hawk or a dove. Uh, the vast, vast majority of Israelis are very patriotic, very optimistic, and by the way, also care much about our uh, roots. And it seems to me that those are key components of national uh, survivor, survival. Uh, and this is contrary to what we see in Europe. Europe has become a very pessimistic continent, very unpatriotic uh, continent and with the lack of uh, optimism and lack of uh, patriotism uh, you you almost forfeit uh, your potential of uh, survival and uh, the opposite is true of, uh, of Israel well I, I'm going to make another probably unpopular comment but I think a lot of that has because that they have they they have blended together and they don't have from what I see as an American observer. I haven't been to to um, Europe in 
many years, but they are so blended that they don't see their own nationalism. Am I am I off base on that? I, I didn't get the, the last. Uh, I said um, to me, it looks like Israel. That, that I'm sorry, uh, the European countries. They are so blended together that they seem to have lost their nationalism within each country. Do do you see that, or am I completely off base? Well, it's it's not only uh, being blended uh, together, but uh, it's also. Uh, uh, lack of uh, desire or lack of interest to flex uh, muscles on behalf of national defense, of national uh, uh, interest. And uh, today's Europe uh, has lost its will to fight against uh, Islamic terrorism, which specifically is threatening what they call the Western infidel, and they announce their aim to bring the Western infidel to submission. But here is uh, Europe uh, only uh, appeasing them and courting them and uh, retreating uh, 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 rather than fighting th that, uh, that threat. And certainly uh, when you lose uh, national uh, roots, uh, you also lose the national purpose uh, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, rather than fight for your history, for the legacy of your founding fathers, uh, you are concerned about your economic su success, you're concerned about your leisure. Uh, so we can do it in Luxembourg or we can do it in Sweden or you can do it in Canada. Uh, why bother about uh, uh, sets of uh, national roots and why bother about national legacy? And in the, pr in the process, they forget that uh, the world is uh, top heavy on rogue elements expecting such uh, feeble, uh, such vacillation. Uh, and once you demonstrate such vacill vacillation, uh, the wolves are going to come out and, uh, uh, and view you as a very easy prey. And this is exactly what is going on in Europe. My hope, my hope is that the U.S. Uh, is going to learn from the U.S., from the European experience by avoiding the European mistakes rather than by repeating those uh, mistakes and avoiding the mistakes in my mind uh, would be uh, revitalizing the legacy of the founding uh, fathers, which has been a, a most successful formula, uh, better, more successful than any uh, uh, country in the world. Uh, this is the formula, the legacy of the founding fathers uh, uh, catapulted the U.S. to the highest level in human uh, history. Uh, why give up such a winning uh, formula? Why distance yourself from the legacy of the founding fathers? Why not hold on to that legacy? Why not cherish and again commemorate that uh, uh, that uh, legacy, which is not only uh, philosophical, it's also cultural, it's also uh, um, a na a national security uh, relevant, it's also uh, economic, it's also technological. Uh, this is uh, the real America, which has made a difference in uh, human history without uh, the, the legacy of the founding fathers, uh, the U.S. wouldn't play that uh, cardinal role in uh, uh, defeating uh, Nazi uh, Germany. Uh, it was the legacy of the founding fathers which led the U.S. to perform such, uh, such a role and then, then obviously to perform the role which uh, more than balanced but in fact defeated the Soviet uh, bloc and to hear uh, elements 
which are trying to distance the U.S. population from the legacy of the founding uh, fathers is a very, very alarming uh, sign, uh, not only to the U.S. itself, but to every ally of the U.S. The free world needs a strong uh, United States. The free world needs a very patriotic and a very optimistic and a very much America first type of uh, U.S. because that's the type of America which saved the world from the jaws of Nazi Germany. You took the words out of my mouth. I was sitting here thinking and, and listening to what you said. Every word of it is so true, but also thinking about the comment that was made when we entered World War II about the sleeping giant has been awakened. Mm -hmm. And that sleeping giant needs to be reawakened in our country because it's, uh, it's taken a little bit of a nap and it needs to wake up again because that is what will save America and that is what will save our world from yeah, exactly. just the incredible threats that we are faced with. Well, maybe it's a mission for Texans to share Texas patriotism with the other 49 states. In fact, uh, yeah. last night uh, we hosted one of our grandchildren, 13 year old, and I showed him uh, a mug which we brought from Texas. Life is too short not to leave it as a Texan. And I said, this is uh, a spirit which you don't see in other states. You see it in, uh, in Texas. That's exactly right. One of the main reasons for that is that we, number one, we were a republic of our own before we joined the United States. And we just celebrated a couple of history uh, days of our own. So we had our Texas Independence Day in March. And then we had, um, of course, the San Jacinto Day, which we just recorded a segment on that recently. Uh, you know, I'm sure, the Texas history, how we lost at the Alamo. But then, not long after that, we won uh, against some pretty amazing odds at the Battle of San Jacinto. And I'm not saying it correctly. It's supposed to be San Jacinto but we kind of Texanized that and call it San Jacinto. But sadly, a lot of people in Texas, they didn't even know we had a San Jacinto day. They didn't know what it was all about. That was a huge victory for Texas. And in fact, it was a huge victory for the Western United States because that facilitated that expansion. It wasn't just Texas. It was other states to the West. And it's a... It, and it's, if, it's, I'm not mistake, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a major role during the San Jacinto battle was played by uh, the Yellow Rose. Uh, yes. And, and there are many people who may think that the Yellow Rose of Texas is a flower and they don't realize it was a, a woman who did make a difference in the battle of uh, San Jacinto. It's funny you say that. I interviewed a lady. She was from my hometown. She is quite accomplished as far as knowing Texas history. She's written some books. We interviewed on San Jacinto Day. I hadn't seen her in a long time, and so we agreed to meet at this particular courthouse to record our interview. And she said, okay, well, I'm driving this certain kind of car, and my license plate has a yellow rose on it. And I thought, well, of course it does. Uh -huh. So it was um that was perfect well in fact in fact our youngest uh, daughter uh, was born in uh, texas when i served as israel's consul general based in houston texas and uh, we decided to uh, give her a texas uh, a texan uh, name which will always remind us of our days in uh, texas and uh, some of our friends say well uh, a perfect uh, name would be uh, Rose, the Yellow Rose. And I said, you know, I, I highly respect the Yellow Rose of Texas, but I don't want my daughter, when she grows up, to assume such a role spending a night with a, an adversary general. And we decided that better than uh, calling her Yellow Rose, uh, we gave her the Hebrew name for Blue Bonnet. And what is had, that? 
uh, it's uh, Deganit, uh, Deganit, or uh, uh, her friends call her Digi, D-I-G-I, and in fact, she has big blue uh, eyes, which, uh, which fit. And recently, uh, before we met uh, back in February, mm -hmm. uh, I went also uh, through Brenham, Texas. And yes. uh, that was a nice reacquaintance with the blue bonnets of, uh, of Texas. Brenham is beautiful. They have just fields of, of blue bonnets and also home of bluebell ice cream. I'll give them a little plug. Right. It's great stuff. Well, I thank you for coming on with me today. It has been incredibly insightful and enjoyable as always. And I definitely want to have another one down the road, not too far. We always enjoy having you on, hearing your insight, and totally enjoy our interviews. So thank you for coming on today. Thank you. It's, an, it's my pleasure. And more, more than that, it's my privilege. Thank you very much. The pleasure and privilege is ours.